from Wikipedia. Jure uxoris, a Latin phrase meaning by right of his wife. Now the first thing we need to note here is that this is being incorrectly translated, likely on purpose. <clears throat> and of course, most Wikipedia articles are heavily censored and are written only from one perspective, like most things that are published in Google or promoted anyway. So <clears throat> it describes the title of nobility used by a man because his wife holds the office of or title suo jure in her own right. Similarly, the husband of an heiress could become the legal possessor of her lands. For example, married women in England and Wales were legally incapable of owning real estate until the Married Women's Property Act 1882. Now, obviously, there's a lot of uh, twisting going on here. And kings who ruled jure uxoris were regarded as co-rulers with their wives and are not to be confused with king's consort who were merely consorts of their wives. Now, the main thing to note here is that this is describing divine right when it uses the word right rather than oath. Jure is, of course, as we'll see later, an oath, and suo being uh, possessive, uh, his or her. Actually, I believe it would be his because sua jure would be her as far as most of the quote-unquote romance languages go, even though they're not very Roman, <laughs> such as French, Spanish, Portuguese, um, Romanian, uh, and some others. French is actually more Germanic, honestly. Well, they say English is a romance language, but, you know, it's not. <clears throat> it's all about uh, all, all roads leading to Rome and the Roman Empire ruling the globe today. Either way, that is what Wikipedia says about jure uxoris in suo jure. Now, when we come to wordreference.com, it says jure, which is French, so yes, it would be a j, uh, whereas Spanish is hurag, is to swear, a firm promise. Uh, yeah, swear a promise. So there you go. Now, in the Constitution, it stipulates, or in the U.S. Constitution, it stipulates uh, the oath that goes to the Commander-in-Chief, which therefore binds all underneath the Commander-in-Chief. And the oaths of enlistment and office are essentially based off of this oath from the Constitution, but they have additions and twists and things like that to obfuscate this oath particularly, but this oath still has to be taken. It is written down in the document, and it is the only oath that matters because, again, the commander-in-chief is the commander of all armed forces. Here it says, before he, and this, of course, is, a, I believe it's Article 1, Section 3, maybe? Anyway, actually, it might be Article 2... Whatever. Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So very specific. And also in the Constitution, it states it's the supreme law of the land. So in this oath here, it's faithfully execute, right? So that has to do with operating in bad faith or in good faith and to the best of ability, recognizing obviously feasibility and things like that, preserve it, protect it, and defend it. Which, of course, means that you have to recognize it as the supreme law of the land. Now, when it comes to kings, we're all familiar with the idea of the coronation by a pope or some sort of religious official, a cleric the um, patriarch, right? And of course, they also do that. They do that mainly with the crowning of emperors being an empire. Ruling over foreign lands is essentially the idea of what is an empire and who is an emperor it is somebody who is in charge of one kingdom and conquers others, right? And pretty much ubiquitously, we are taught that 
all kings and all emperors are crowned by uh, by the Pope or some other religious official, thus imparting the divine right. But then there are other ways that we find kings being made without having a crowning by some sort of religious official, such as with the sword from the stone. Whoever pulls the sword from the stone becomes king of England. And there's all kinds of other ideas as far as where a king derives their uh, their authority from, not right. But we, uh, because we're so ruled by Roman propaganda today, we are all taught that it's essentially there's only one type of king, and that's a king that's crowned by a religious, clerical individual. And there's no other ways that kings can exist. But of course, you do have the Disney movie of the sword in the stone. Now, going back to Wikipedia, it states that the coronation of the British monarch Coronation of the Monarch of the United Kingdom is an initiation ceremony in which they are formally invested with regalia, meaning clothed, obviously, or maybe not obvious to uh, everyone, but yeah, um, clothed, and crowned at Westminster Abbey. <clears throat> that's funny, coronation means crown, so uh, that's sort of redundant then because the coronation is, is a crowning, right? It means crowning. It corresponds to the coronations that formerly took place in other European monarchies, which have all abandoned coronations in favor of inauguration or enthronement ceremonies. That's funny because coronation is technically an enthronement ceremony, but we'll go ahead and look at those in a minute. The coronation is a symbolic formality and does not signify the official beginning of the monarch's reign de jure and de facto. Their reign commences from the moment of the preceding monarch's death, maintaining legality continuity legal continuity of the monarchy. So that's funny, that whole section there, right? You always know that they're lying or twisting something when they don't give the translation for a word. Here they just state de jure and de facto without translating it. De jure obviously meaning of oath, being jure, to swear. De facto of fact, de being of. And a legal continuity would have to do specifically with paperwork. Something that is legal is something that is quote unquote reduced to writing in the words of a particularly corrupt British judge. So even from their own mouths of the corrupt controllers, they stipulate that legal is reduced to writing. That's it. It just means something's written down. Whether it's legitimate or not is something else entirely. The coronation usually takes place several months after the death of the monarch's predecessor, as it is considered a joyous occasion that would be inappropriate while mourning continues. This interval also gives planners enough time to complete the required elaborate arrangements. Most recent coronation took place on 6 of May 2023 to crown King Charles III and Queen Camilla. The ceremony is performed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the most senior cleric in the Church of England, of which the monarch is supreme governor. So there you get the same idea of a king being made by a church, right? The church makes the king. It's not the oath. It's not the fact. It's not any sort of other binding thing. It is the church that does it because the church is the one that imparts the crown. And then once that's done, as it states, the supreme governor is the monarch, at least in this sense. But then the king's chosen by the cleric. So who's who's? it's like the chicken or the egg, right? Which came first? Now, when we click on that little inauguration thing, it states in governments and politics, right? Government, obviously, being an entity that governs, and politic being groups of people. Those two words, just like these words, are incredibly obfuscated to mean something else today. Whereas the people that are using them usually are using them in a correct manner, but then they're teaching a different meaning to someone else, imparting meaning or only extracting one meaning from it, saying it's the only meaning, and, such and as such, people get confused and don't use these words right. Anyway, inauguration is the process of swearing a person into office and thus making that person the incumbent. Right, here we go again with using jargon. 
if it's possible incumbent doesn't mean what it's the way it's used anyway such an inauguration commonly occurs through a formal ceremony or special event which may also include an inaugural address by the new official the word inauguration stems from the latin augur which refers to rituals of ancient roman priests seeking to interpret it if it was the will of the go gods or a, for a public official but to be deemed worthy to assume office. So there you go again, they're, they're twisting it and they're putting it back in the hands of religious clerics, right? Not a religious faith, an organization that declares itself the controller of religious faith, the essential step between the creator being and the layman, the regular people, right? So here they're trying to twist this back to state that any official who is inaugurated is done so by the will of the church, specifically, obviously, the papacy, the, the pontiff being bridge builder, the Roman pontiff, the crowner of the Holy Roman Emperor, and thus, subsequently, we have the United Nations, which is the Holy Roman Empire, again, by a different name. So here they're stating that any public official throughout the globe, anyone that is inaugurated, is done so because of the tradition of Roman clerics doing it, right? So this is the basis of the age-old conflict of where someone derives their authority and whether or not it's legitimate. There's one side that sees it as responsibility, as a, a oath that's taken that binds that person to a particular type of conduct. The position is carried out on behalf of whom? Is it carried out on behalf of the people or is it carried out on behalf of the church? Because those things are usually mutually exclusive. When something is carried out on behalf of the church, it is usually against the will of the people. And when something is carried out on, by the will of the people, it is usually against the hierarchical control of the church. And this conflict is centuries old and it is still going on today, as we can see from this very Wikipedia article. The person writing this is clearly operating for one side, as we usually find to be the pattern among wikipedia articles and google promoted uh hits and stuff now an enthronement is a ceremony of inauguration right you see that twist that they do there it's a ceremony of inauguration it is not obviously the only type of inauguration they're just stating it's a type of inauguration which would mean a coronation is also a type of inauguration but they always tried to twist it to make it seem like the only type of authority comes from the church, whether it's inauguration, coronation, or enthronement. And usually there is, in fact, a coronation and enthronement done at the same time. But here they're trying to divide it and say there's separate things. <clears throat> anyway, involving a person, usually a monarch, or religious leader being formally seated for the first time upon their throne. Enthronements may also feature as a part of a larger coronation. Right, yeah. In general sense, an enthronement may also refer to a ceremony marking a monarch's accession. Generally distinguished from a coronation is no crown or other regalia is physically bestowed upon the one being enthroned, although regalia may be present at the ceremony. Yes, but of course you could do both, where you have a crowning and an enthronement. Enthronements occur in both church and state settings, since the throne is seen as a symbol of authority, both secular and spiritual. There you go, tied back to the church, right? As always, which will always go back to the Roman church, because they have declared command over the entire world and dominance. To the detriment of the people that live on the globe, obviously. Because... If the people were free to do whatever they wanted, then you wouldn't need a church, right? The people aren't free to do whatever they want because the church goes in and then stipulates to them what they can do. But then who stipulates to the church, right? And that thus you have the age-old conflict, as we will see later in this video. Enthronements are most popular in religious settings as a chair is seen as a symbol of the authority to teach. 
Thus, in Christianity, bishops of almost all denominations have a ceremony of enthronement after they assume office or by which they assume office. The Eastern Orthodox Churches and the Oriental Orthodox Churches, as well as the Lutheran Churches and the Anglican Communion, often have elaborate ceremonies marking the inauguration of their episcopates. However, in the Catholic Church, the right of enthronement is limited to Eastern Catholic Churches. By the, in, in these, enthronement is the right by which a new bishop assumes authority over his epic part she, and before he is forbidden to intervene in its governance in any way, whether personally or by proxy. Now this gets even more interesting when we look up the verb, the transitive verb of to divine, to divine, which means discover by intuition or insight, infer, to discover or locate something such as underground water or minerals, usually by means of a divining rod. Now obviously, infer, as many might see it actually is to guess it means to guess to divine something is to guess here when we look at adivinar notice adivinar is the spanish word for to guess to divine discern glimpse perceive or intuit now even though it is written here as one word it's actually two because you separate the first A and you get DVNAR because A is to in Spanish. It's to something or to someone. And when you pull A out, the A out, you get DVNAR or divine. Very easy. And naturally these words and these languages get screwed up so that people are made ignorant because they don't understand that these words are used in a certain way, and they still are today, but then the meanings get obfuscated. So, now we come to this particular Wikipedia article called The League of Leji, uh, Albanian, I don't know how to say that, it was a military and diplomatic alliance of the Albanian aristocracy, created in the city of Leji on the 2nd of March, 1444. The League of Legia is considered the first unified, independent Albanian country in the medieval age, with Skanderbeg as leader of the regional Albanian chieftains and nobles united against the Ottoman Empire. I would say more like united against the people, but, you know, they're always going to represent it only in the sense of their own control, because at the time, as is now, most of these countries were con controlled by one particular overarching entity that showed conflict and, and always presented it as the control of the juridic entity and not the control of the individuals. Anyway, Skanderbeg was proclaimed chief of the League of the Albanian People, right in office, while Skanderbeg always signed himself as Dominus Albine. Dominus obviously meaning dominate. Domination of Albania has a very different ring to it than and so naturally they don't translate these things and or they'll mistranslate them you know they always do that lord of albania right that's what they translate it to lord of albania see that's the difference that has to do with somebody who is domineering versus somebody who is responsible well they are responsible but they're not responsible to the people of albania at least they're seeking to dominate Albania, not carry out a office that is on the at the benefit of the Albanians. Anyway, at the Assembly of Legia, members from the families Castrioti, Arianiti, Zaharia, Musaka, Spani, Thopia, Balsha, and Trunojevic, or Yevich, however you say that, which were linked matrinially or via marriage to the castrioti were present the members contributed to the league with men and money while maintaining control of the internal affairs of their domains it sounds like a centralized bank to me soon after its creation the provenetian balsici and chernoyevici left the league in the events that led to the albanian venetian war 1447 to 48 Peace Treaty of the Albanian Venetian War, signed on October 4th, 1448, was the first diplomatic document on which the League appears as an independent entity. 
Barletti referred to the meeting as the Ge Generalis Concilium, or Universum Concilium. And now notice the incorrect translation. General Council or Whole Council. No, it would be General Council or Universal Council. That's the difference. If you say Universal Council, that sounds quite a lot like United Nations, doesn't it? Or the University, or the, the well, the various universal entities that are you can find everywhere around the globe today, and they have ridiculous amounts of control against the will of the people, right? Universities can basically do whatever they want. They're a part of a universal structure that is uh, to the detriment of the human populace. Anyway, the term League of Legge was coined by subsequent historians. Now here we come to the next Wikipedia article in this theme called the League of Nations Union, or LNU. It was an organization formed in October 1918 in Great Britain to promote international justice, collective security, and permanent peace between nations based on the ideals of the League of Nations. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. This is basically the same crap repeated over and over and over again, slightly varied names and whatnot, but they always have the same elements, right? The UN, right? So you got the UN here, NU, switch the U out, you have LUN. So there's all kinds of different ways that you find these things manifesting themselves. And it's usually pretty obvious what they're doing. They're attempting to remove responsibility, remove control, remove oath, and all of those things that have to do with responsibility of the people, and put it in the hands of someone else. It always has to be someone else, especially when you're talking about conquest and obviously all the other awful things that these entities are designed to do. Anyway, the League of Nations was established by the Great Powers. Great Powers. Oh. It's part of the Paris Peace Treaties, the international settlement that followed the First World War. Creation of a General Association of Nations was the final one of President Wood, final, final one. Creation of General Association of Nations was a final one. That's a really weird way to word that. Anyway, President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. The LNU became the largest and most influential organization in the British peace movement. Yes, because if you call it a peace movement, that's what it is, right? Despite the fact that they go around warmongering and constantly dividing people and causing conflict and stuff like that. By the mid-1920s, it had over a quarter million registered subscribers. Isn't that odd? Registered subscribers? And its membership eventually peaked at around 407,775 in 1931. That doesn't actually sound like a lot of people. We're talking about an international global movement. 407,000 is not that many. They haven't even peaked a million there. By the 19, they're not even close to a million actually. I mean, they're a hundred thousand off from even half a million. So by the 1940s, after the disappointments of the international crisis of the 1930s and the descent into World War II, membership fell to about 100,000. Yeah, sure, quite a large unit movement here with subscribers, right? Registered subscribers. It's so strange. The LNU was formed on 13th of October 1918 by the merger, right? Merger. What is that merger? It's two corporations that merge together. It's odd. Of the League of Free Nations Association and the League of Nations Society. <sighs> you love these, these names that they appoint for themselves. If you call it something, then that means it's that, right? No. Two older organizations already work for the establishment of a new and transparent. Yeah. Transparent for whom? System of international relations, human rights as then understood, and for world peace through disarmament and universal collective security. There's that word again, universal. Rather than traditional approaches such as the balance of power and the creation of power blocks through secret treaties. So this is the usual this one or that one where both sides are controlled. There is never, ever, ever any reference to individual culpability or responsibility or duty, except when it is in reference to the overall hierarchical command control of the church, which is the entity that, in fact, 
gives the divine or the guessing who guess the authority for everyone. Anyway, chapters of the LNU were set up in the dominions and in allied nations, including in the capital city of the states of Australia. There you go again. Dominions easily translated to Dominus, like the title given to Skanderbeg. And here, when we come to the European wars of religion, we get an understanding that there is a major conflict today still going on, and it dates back possibly even to the first idea of history or, or, or even before that. And that is one entity with the ability to impart divine authority or guest authority onto someone else versus responsibility and duty to the individuals that form the support base, whichever way you want to look at that. It's the quote-unquote divine right of kings versus the king's oath. It is the crowning by a priest or cleric versus the words and the uh, treaties and the papers that are sworn to and written by a particular entity, right? Where is the authority derived? Well, anytime there is a rising up against religious authority, there is always conflict and wide scale conflict, always. So that is the easiest way to point to this and to see it through these themes of religious wars because it's the moment that people start questioning the church's authority, there are mass casualties, chaos, and conflict. The moment that somebody states, sure, people may have sins, but what about the sins of the church, right? As soon as somebody states sins of the church, you have war because they are the most evil and they want to remove responsibility and duty so that they are the ones that hold the reins of all emperors, kings, presidents, it doesn't matter, everything. They claim authority over everything. The European wars of religion were a series of wars waged in Europe during the 16th, 17th, and early 18th centuries. And technically 15th, 14th, and even before that. The wars disrupted the religious and political order in the Catholic countries of Europe or Christendom. Other motives during the wars involved revolt, territory ambitions, and greater power conflicts. See here they're trying to make this more complicated than it really is, which is the people versus the church. And the church's agents, obviously, because they don't just, you know, they have agents and mercenaries and expansive networks of spies and sellouts, pretty much, and traitors and all that stuff. By the end of the Thirty Years' War, Catholic France had allied with the Protestant forces against the Catholic Habsburg monarchy. Yeah, so it's always groups fighting, right? It's never individuals. It's never um, domestic sovereignty, right? It's, it's always presented as two elements that are equally controlled by the same group or entity as them doing it, right? It's never, they just completely ignore the idea of individual uh, liberty of choice. Or freedom of choice. The words were largely ended by the Peace of Westphalia, the wars, which established a new political order that is now known as Westphalian sovereignty. The conflicts began with the Minor Knights Revolt, 1522. Well, that's not that's not true. Followed by the larger German Peasants' War in the Holy Roman Empire. Warfare intensified after the Catholic Church began to counter Reformation against the growth of Protestantism in 1545. The conflicts culminated in the Thirty Years' War, which devastated Germany and killed one-third of its population. And here we go, like, the, here's the threat, right? The veiled threat. If you challenge the authority of the Church, there will be mass casualties. That is always the threat. Now, the Reformation, if anybody knows anything about that, and here it says, of course, the Catholic Church began the counter-Reformation, right? Just like counter-terrorism, right? Well, the Reformation was the idea of the Church's sins and how they were selling absolution, right? You could pay the Church and you'd be absolved of anything. At least that's even what we're taught about the Reformation. But it goes on uh, before that. 
it, it did not start with the minor knight's revolt, right? A diminishing term, minor revolt. Here, with the Hussite Wars, we find out that, in fact, the conflict of people versus church had been going on for a long time. Because it, that previous article said it started in 1522, I believe. Well, this is the same idea, same conflict, same everything, but it was in 1419 through 1435, also called the Bohemian Wars or the Hussite Revolution, where a series of civil wars, right? Civil wars. No, they weren't civil wars. They weren't as, well, I mean, they might have involved a lot of civilians, sure, but they weren't in a wholly civil, right? And also, this had to do with the same thing that the Reformation and all the wars of religion had to do. This was yet another war of religion. The Hussites and the combined Catholic forces of Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund the Papacy and the European monarchs loyal to the Catholic Church, as well as various Hussite factions, at a late stage of the conflict, the Ultrakists changed sides in 1432 to fight alongside Roman Catholics and oppose the Taborites and other Hussite spinoffs. These wars lasted from 1419 to approximately 1434. Now, there's a lot of twisting here, such as with the idea of all of these spinoff factions and all these groups that call themselves one thing, but they don't follow it. They, You see this so often today where you have all of these groups that pop up and claim themselves leaders of a movement even though that movement, practically speaking, doesn't do anything under the word of those individuals, right? They're just showboating. They're just pretending like they're controlling it. You see it all over the all over the place. The church is completely constructed, and it's all about the appearance rather than substance. It's about appearing and looking to be something, and then removing anything that is contrary. It is the age-old reference to catching a fraudster if you want to know that something's a fraud you put the genuine article next to it and you will always know the difference of course if the genuine article is a fraud itself then well you know good luck there the unrest began after pre-protestant christian reformer jan hus was executed by catholic church in 1415 for heresy <coughs> there's also a video game that talks about this. Because King Wenceslaus IV of Bohemia had plans to be crowned the Holy Roman Emperor requiring papal coronation. Notice that there, right? Requiring papal coronation. He suppressed the religion of the Hussites, yet it continued to spread. Obviously, they only will represent this in one way. And that is groups versus groups, not individuals against a disgusting and vile empire of Rome that is still causing conflicts today throughout every nation. When King Wenceslaus IV died of natural causes a few years later, the tension stemming from the Hussites grew stronger. In Prague and various other parts of Bohemia, the Catholic Germans living there were forced out. Wenceslaus' brother Sigismund, who had inherited the throne, was outraged by the spread of Hussitism. He received permission from the Pope to launch a crusade against the Hussites. The large number of crusaders came from all over Europe to fight. They made early advances, forcing the Hussites back and taking Prague. However, the Hussites reorganized and took back nearly all the land they had lost, resulting in the failure of the crusade. Of course, those crusaders are, in fact, mercenaries, as they have always been. They are simply soldiers for hire, people paid to go and ruin another people group, usually from an area that is consequently or consequently being ruined by the people that they're attacking. And so it's sort of like everybody comes out uh, with a black eye, right? Here, the Swiss mercenaries, Reislaufer, were a powerful infantry force constituted by a by professional sword soldiers originating from the cantons of the old Swiss Confederacy. They were notable for their service in foreign armies, especially among the military forces of the kings of France throughout the early modern period of European history. From the late Middle Ages into the Renaissance, their service as mercenaries was at its peak during the Renaissance when their proven battlefield capabilities made them sought after mercenary troops. There followed a period of decline as technological and organizational advances counteracted the Swiss advantages. Switzerland's military isolationism largely put an end to organized mercenary activity the principal remnant of the practice is the pontifical swiss guard at the vatican go figure and here we've got this depiction from 1413 
Now, that coincides with the wars of religion, and they definitely had a big impact because if you're attempting to dominate a populace as the detracted Roman Empire, which divides and conquers, divide, divide et impera, or divide an empire, well, the best way to do that, obviously, is with mercenaries. Send them around, sacking and destroying the area and stealing people's stuff. As has happened time and time again, and was all the world purpose of all the world wars, of which arguably we had more than just two. Next, we have the Tercios, or Tercios, was a military unit of the Spanish army during the reign of Catholic monarchs and the Spanish Habsburgs in the early modern period. They were the elite military units of the Spanish monarchy and the essential pieces of the powerful land forces of the Spanish Empire, right? There's all these stupid descriptive words adding importance to something or diminishing it, right? Minor revolution or, or minor revolt versus powerful and great and grand. These articles always come from one perspective, and that's the pro-Roman one. All of them. Same thing with Google. It's quite ridiculous. It's so in your face that they are our emperors and we do what they say and none of us have any freedom or ability to choose because we're all their property. Property of the Vatican. Anyway, um, <clears throat> central powerful land fighting force of the Spanish Empire, sometimes also fighting with the Navy. Spanish tercios, tercios were one of the finest professional infantries in the world due to the effectiveness of their battlefield formations and were a crucial step in the formation of modern European armies. Made up of professional volunteers instead of levies raised for a campaign or hired mercenaries typically used by other European countries at the time, right? Notice that little last tiny part there that's probably the most impactful. Hired mercenaries. The tercios were mercenaries, just like the Swiss Guard. Exactly the same probably mostly used as mercenaries more than anything else to go ravage somebody else's land because those people had come to the realization that the church was the most vile and evil organization on the planet and was subverting and destroying their lives, right? Everybody's lives, just out of sheer malice and desire to control everything. And that is... Subsequently, the main element of pretty much all religions throughout the globe is that the people that run them are contemptuous and hateful and prideful, too. Extremely arrogant. And they usually have a fake uh, a facade of niceness, which is generally dropped when they realize that there is nothing else. And then they become completely and overtly vindictive and destructive, right? They just... these types of people would, as the saying goes, rather rule over the ashes than lose control. The internal administrative organization of the Tercios and their battlefield formation and tactics grew out of the innovations of Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba during the conquest of Granada and the Italian wars in the 1490s and 1500s. <clears throat> yeah, what does that correlate with, right? Hussite wars and wars religion and so on and so forth, even though we'll usually find that this stuff goes back long before all of this stuff. It's just a continuation of the same old, same old. Which is a small group of individuals from a detracted position trying to manage and rule the globe. Now we come to the routiers. Where mercenary soldiers in the Middle Ages, their particular distinction from other paid soldiers at the time was that they were organized into bands, ruta or root. The first is the term is first used in the 12th century, but is particularly associated with free companies who terrorized the French countryside during the Hundred Years' War. And likely plays into the same theme as always. As we see, mercenary bands were mainly seen in France, Aquitaine, and Occitania, but also Normandy, England, and the lands of the Holy Roman Emperor. So, like, basically all Europe. They were noted for their lawlessness, with many complaints from the church about their depredations. Yeah, they were sent by the church, right? It's like it's like the church, they published this thing condemning slavery and, and pedophilia, and yet you find out that pretty much the entire structure is rampant with it, right? That all the priests or pedophiles are involved in it. They're all involved in slave trafficking. But the church declared that it's evil and it's a sin, and they're not for it, even though they continue being for it. And, Practic practicality, right? 
leading to an explicit condemnation by the third Letarian council. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. The condemn it, um, decree that it's bad, but do it and get heavily involved with it yourself. And of course, be the uh, driving force behind it. <laughs> Typical sort of cowardice. Now we come to a book that has some rather obvious Roman imperial imagery in it. And that is this book from 1886 called Bolivia, Sept on it's Seven Years de Exploration de Voyage et de Sojour. It's explorations, uh, travels, and sojourns, I suppose you might you know, say it like that. Uh, I believe that says Dawn. So, through La Amérique Austral. This, that's the Western America, instead of, of course, Australia being uh, the Western, Australia being the Western land, or whatever. Also similar to the word astral, avec un preface, so it's with a prefix, well, yeah, the rest of this doesn't really matter. Just notice that image right there that you see. The sun over the mountain on this uh, banner, sort of strangely designed banner. There's a number of stars here, the eagle, and naturally all of it being held by what appears to be some sort of Roman or Greek goddess. Now in this book, on the preface, there's a particularly interesting poem that appears to be explaining something that would happen after this book's publishing date and states in germany begins a dance which passes passeth through italy spain and france but england shall pay piper now it's interesting what that sounds like and i would I would be interested in knowing what what others might think that means, but to me, it sounds like the Second World War and the First World War and the Holy Roman Empire and this and the UN and all the conflicts that have con continuously been staged by an imperial mechanism, a cat's paw of the Vatican. Now you get this extremely and inaccurate and highly insulting statue image, right? It's clearly supposed to be a statue because of the base here of a man dressed in European clothes who is sheltering an Indian. And then they have all these paintings and whatnot of Indians that would bow and do all this stuff to Europeans coming here. Now that's just completely inaccurate. But you should, it, it, the, the contempt comes through and it is a very clearly religious contempt of everyone are poor sinners and they're all subjects of the church. And here it states Christopher Columbus presents the American to the old world. So insulting. And it's intentional, right? It is intentional. These people are despicable individuals who hold nothing but contempt for everyone else and they wouldn't control everyone. It's the, possibly the biggest organization of Karens that have ex has ever existed. Now, also notice here on this, this page that it references the La Compagnie Universelle du Canal Internationique. There you go again. The, always this theme of the word universe being used. Universal organization, union, universal league, universal government, always with the universe. And today, across the nation, we have the most despicable, revisionist, editorial censorship mechanism of universities designed to destroy cultures, destroy nations, and obfuscate all knowledge, essentially damage and destroy the comprehensive, the understanding and the capabilities of the human populace globally. Now we come to a different book here, also 1886, called Les, Les Belges 
dans l'Afrique centrale. So that's the Belgians through the Central Africa of voyages, adventures, and discoveries. The Congo and says uh, Afouan. So in this book, we find a lot of interesting pictures. Here we have Le Roi du Congo, so that's the king of the Congo. Recevant une ambassade portugaise. So receiving a Portuguese ambassador. All of the Portuguese are on their knees showing fealty to the Congonese king, Don Al it looks like Alvaro uh, Rex Congo, as you see above the head in the picture. That is very contrary to how Roman depictions of the time period are presented of all the savage peoples bowing and worshipping these European conquerors like their gods. Very inaccurate. Completely not true. And here we do have a depiction uh, showing the opposite, which is surprising that such a book will even be allowed at the time period, considering there was still heavy and rampant control, but maybe not so much as today of the Roman pontif Pontifical Empire, whatever you want to call it. Here we have the coronation of the King Alphonse. And here we see in front of a throne, we have a crown and some other objects, a bag and then three rings. And on one side, you have what are, must be the nobility, and on the other side, the general people, and everybody's in celebration. And you notice there is no main apparent hierarchical cleric that is going to do the crowning here. It is simply something where he comes there, picks it up, sits down, and then is done. Does it himself. Now, here's one of these stranger pictures, but she can't find any references to this individual, and it's titled The King Plenty. But anyone would notice that he's wearing a white robe with a specific type of cross. Looks almost like a crusader, but not wearing any armor or anything like that. And also very humbly sitting on a log out in the forest. But he's also wearing a hat that looks very similar to the types of hat that archbishops and bishops and just general religious clerics might wear across the globe in the religious structures that are all subsidiary components of the Roman Empire. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please check out my other content. There are books, free books available, PDFs anyway, at the links provided as well as the various QR code uh, mechanism. Also, if you so choose, you may support my work at Venmo, buy me a coffee, PayPal, Cash App. Thank you.